So, but today is our day to focus on the D. Wynne Thorne Lecture. It is a long tradition here at Utah State. Each year, the university selects one of its most outstanding faculty members for the highest research alkali. To be selected as a D. Wynne Thorne Career Research Awardee is to be recognized essentially for decades-long work, a career of, a, uh, of astounding accomplishment that's recognized both by the university and by our peers. It includes a, 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 a external, uh, national, and international recognition. And I'm proud to say all of our awardees have, have garnered that kind of accolades. Lance Seafelt, Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, is our 2012 D. Winthorne Career Research Awardee. And we're going to be having the privilege of hearing from him today talking not only about his passion for his research, but the groundbreaking nature of, of his work. When he became a scientist, he became someone who, who inspires us. And I saw that firsthand this morning because we had our presidential doctoral research fellows uh, sit down and have breakfast with the man. And I'll tell you, their eyes were this big, saying, can I ever be in those shoes? And that's sort of neat. That's really what you want to have it all about. So we have a little uh, 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 video here. I'm Lance Seafeld. I'm a professor of chemistry and biochemistry here at Utah State University. And I came here 18 years ago in 1993. What I really love about uh, research in chemistry and biochemistry is the idea that you can push the frontier of knowledge. You can discover something that nobody's known ever before, that's existed for millions of years, and, and you're the first person to know that. Utah State University obviously values research and makes it a very high priority, understands the impact of research on the education and that the, the two feed each other. And so the university has been very good about supporting uh, that through excellent facilities, excellent equipment, and support for students. Yeah, the D. Wynn Thorne Award is obviously quite an honor. The university is saying, yeah, what you're doing here is a value, and the training of students and pushing the frontier, publishing in top quality journals is something we value, and, uh, and we, I certainly appreciate that recognition. Now let me ask uh, Jim McMahon, Dean of Science, to come up and do a proper in introduction. The sad thing is, proper is probably beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing this just so I can abuse Lance, and I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Throughout his career, chemistry and biochemistry professor Lance Seafeld has studied unusually broad topics in the area of nitrogenase research and has made valuable contributions to the discipline as well as to Utah State University. His work has made him the world's expert <coughs> in nitrogenase enzymology, the molecular phenomenon that accounts for crop production, which the lives of two-thirds of Earth's population depend on. Lance created a new understanding of how a nitrogen molecule is reduced to yield two ammonia molecules by nitrogenase. For a long time, this mechanism of nitrogenase remained elusive. Lance's research, however, contributed to the understanding of how nitrogen binds to the metal center of the enzyme. His research further provided significant insights into the step-by-step -step order of the electron transfer events during chemical process. These results have changed the field's thinking about how metalloenzymes activate inert small molecule substrates, and this knowledge will further research for artificial catalysis. Lance received his doctorate in biochemistry from the University of California, Riverside in 1989. He held positions at University of Redlands, University of California, Riverside, and University of Georgia. He had trouble keeping a job. <laughs> <laughs> Before coming to Utah State in 1998. At USU, Lance served uh, as a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry since 2002. He's also a director of science at the USU Bioenergy Center. Lance's research uh, publications are many. Nearly 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts have been cited in scientific journals more than 3,000 times. He's been awarded more than $4 million in extramural funding for his laboratory. His funders include National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Throughout his research career, Lance has mentored 25 undergraduate research students, six doctoral students, four masters, and six postdoctoral fellows. 
As one of the founding members of the USTAR biofuels team at USU, he has initiated a new research program in his laboratory on the feasibility of using algae as a source of biofuels, such as biodiesel. Lance's productive and innovative discoveries in the field of computational chemistry, as well as his continued service to his department and students, set him apart as an exemplary researcher. He is well deserving of the 2012 D. Winthorpe Career Award. There's just one more part, and this one has a sort of a different title. Um, the title of this section is called How Lance Found His Wife. Mm. <laughs> uh, Kim, a, a young woman who was interested in enzymology, was a student in food science and taking Scott Ensign's enzymology course. This was shortly after Scott and Lance got tenure. Lance had essentially worked 24-7 to that point and was single. Many of his colleagues in the department had tried to set him up on dates, but he was never interested. <laughs> Poor guy. Well, Kim turned out to be the top student in enzymology and one of the brightest the faculty had seen. Scott Ensign mentioned to Lance that he had this really bright and pretty girl in his class. Scott urged him to think about asking her on a date. So this sounds good so far, right? <laughs> Wait till you hear what's revealed about this guy. This is, I mean, this is the stuff novels are made of. Lance got interested. <laughs> but he's very shy. Kim needed to do NMR work as part of her PhD project, and so Lance used his in. He found out when she had signed up to use the NMR, then coincidentally showed up in the NMR room while she was there and asked her if she needed help. <laughs> this is great so far. He's just you know, a faculty member trying to help someone else. The funny thing is, he knew absolutely nothing about how to run NMR <laughs> <laughs> and had never even sat at the seat at the council. But it gave him the end that he needed, and the rest, of course, is history. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Jim, for that introduction I didn't expect. <laughs> and uh, it's almost all true. <laughs> and thank you, Vice President, for the kind words as well. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out for taking a couple hours out of your day to listen to what I have to say. That's a joke. All right, not a couple hours. I was told I was supposed to stick to 20 minutes. So what I want to do is, uh, is just first uh, tell you, first of all, how honored I am to be selected for the D. Wynn Thorne Award for reasons that I didn't even fully appreciate until earlier this week. So many of you probably know that D. Wynn Thorne uh, was a very accomplished scientist and, and very important uh, leader at, at Utah State University. He was the director of the vision research here at USU. He was a director of the Ag Experiment Station and then was the very first vice president for research. And what I knew that he had worked on uh, soil fertility and plant uh, nutrition early in his career and wrote one of the definitive books that still is recognized around the world, the Irrigated Soils. What I hadn't realized is that he had actually worked in the same field that I've worked in and he's published papers that I probably should have looked at and I hadn't because they were <laughs> too old in the literature, right? And so I, went, I started looking back just the other day and realized that when he was at uh, Iowa State College uh, that he had published on rhizobium, which is the exact uh, organisms that I work on. And then much to my surprise, as I was looking through some of these publications, I saw one where he published with Robert Burris. And Bob Burris is a, a real legend in the field of nitrogen fixation. I'm twice descended from Bob Burris. So my PhD advisor and my postdoc mentor both worked under Bob Burris. And to see that uh, D. Wynn Thorne had co-published with Bob Burris was really an important point for me. And so I was really uh, moved when I saw that. It makes it especially important uh, to win this award in his name. Also, uh, very humbling when I looked through the list of folks that have received this award in the past. Uh, I know many of these people, I hold them in very high regard, going back all the way uh, to Jack Spence and Tom Emery from my department, and then you can look through the list of folks here, and you can see the, you know, some of the legends at Utah State University. So it's very humbling to be included in that group of, of folks, including now uh, Professor John Neely, who will be the 2013 uh, recipient of this award. So as I thought about what I wanted to do in, in this talk, I decided that I, would, uh, that I would tell you three stories. And the first story is, is how I came to work on nitrogenase. 
And then the second story is what we've done with nitrogenase and, and uh, some of the outputs of that and especially focusing on the people. And then the last story I'll tell you about is one that I've been thinking a lot about recently and that is how to avoid work. <laughs> All right, so let me start by, by telling you, as I've think, been thinking about you know, my work in nitrogen fixation and biochemistry, um, three things that were, I think, influential in my uh, decision to work in this area. One is that where I grew up, I grew up in Southern California uh, amongst orange groves. Those orange groves don't exist anymore, but at the time when I lived there in the 60s and 70s, we were surrounded by orange groves, and orange, oranges dominated the culture. And the culture was all about agriculture. And so I became uh, fascinated and bitten by agriculture and the importance of feeding people and how powerful that was. And so that was an important influence uh, later as I started to think about what I wanted to work on. The other thing that was important for the younger folks in the crowd, you may not know this, but there were days of the week you couldn't buy gasoline back in the 70s. The older folks are all shaking their heads. They all remember that there was even days and odd days because of the oil embargo. So the, this happened to be an even day. So if you have an even, even license plate, you could buy gasoline. But if you had an odd license plate, you couldn't. This was a time of turmoil in, in the energy sector. And this had a big influence on me. I was a teenager at the time wanting to drive my car. And uh, I wanted to play a role in energy and making America energy independent. And so you'll see that's going to come through in some of the things that I've been pursuing. And then the last thing I'll say is that uh, in high school, this is a common story, I had a high school chemistry teacher who was very good. And that made a big difference for me. And you, many of you have the same story. And this, so it's the importance of a high school chemistry teacher. And just to show you how sort of bitten I was by this, I've got my very first uh, biochemistry book that I ever looked at here. And the other day I was uh, thumbing through it and I went to the second page. Here it is right here. And what you'll see is I've actually marked on here, this is tRNA. It wasn't labeled in the book. So I marked it in the book that it was tRNA. And I marked the page that you should refer to to go look at it. So just this morning I was, I was looking at that page. I flipped to page 229. And much to my surprise, I see there was an error in one of the base pairs. And I had corrected it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously I was... I was, I was really taken by chemistry, and I was taken by biochemistry in particular, and I realized this was something I really was excited about. But I had a big barrier, and the big barrier was that I was the first person in my family, immediate family, ever to consider going to college. So I was the first generation. I had very supportive parents, but we had, didn't have the resources, nor did we have the culture of going to college. And so for me, I had a lot of encouragement from my parents and also from uh, counselors and whatnot in the high school. And, and fortunately, I was given an opportunity uh, to go to a liberal arts college. And this was a, really a great opportunity to go to the University of Redlands. It was close by to where I grew up. Uh, it was a really a very prestigious school, still is a very prestigious school. And the only reason I was able to do this was because of the generous grants and uh, loans that were given by the federal government at the time and also because of the package that was put together by the university. And I thought a lot about what I learned from the University of Redlands. Obviously, I learned science and learned chemistry and biochemistry. That's where I became addicted to biochemistry. But I think I learned some other things as well, and that is I took um, politics class. I took classes in history. The hardest class I ever took as an undergraduate was pottery class, believe it or not. <laughs> I, was on a, I was on a scholarship. I was trying to keep my GPA up, and it was very hard. I had to come in on weekends. I, those, those students made it look so easy. It was so difficult for me. I'd rather have taken a chemistry class. And so, but the one thing I, I remember about, what I remember most about the University of Redlands was that once a month, we would go to dinner with one of the faculty members at their house. And so I, I got to talk politics and science. We did lots of things there. But I think what it planted in me was, this is a career I could see myself in, right? Because I had role models now. I could see their families. I could see their hobbies. I could see that this was, these were real people that had, you know, real lives. And so I could see that this was a, something that I could see myself doing. And so I wonder at a big state university like Utah State if students have that opportunity still, that opportunity to get to know faculty members outside the classroom, right? And that's something I'll let you think about, I think a lot about, and think about is there better ways that we can help make that happen. So I learned a lot at, at uh, University of Redlands, but it was a small school. And what I really needed to go to the next level was to sort of go up to the next level in schools. And so I was encouraged to pursue graduate study and again, this, this is now I'm the first generation to go to college. Now I'm definitely the first generation to go on to graduate school. And fortunately for me, with my love of agriculture and energy, there was a top-notch school just down the road, the University of California at Riverside. And when I showed up at University of California at Riverside, I was really quite surprised to learn that you could go to school and somebody else would pay you. 
<laughs> wow, I couldn't believe that. Now, they didn't pay me very much, but, uh, but I did end up with $1,000 or so at the end of the year extra, so that was pretty cool. I was really excited about it. But more importantly, at the University of California, Riverside, I was exposed to some of the top scientific minds of the country. There was a, a National Academy member who I took a class from. I didn't care about what he was teaching, but I wanted to take a class from a National Academy member. So I just was a sponge. and I really learned everything I could. And of course, agriculture, this is one of the better agricultural schools in the country. And what I started to work on when I was a graduate student there was to start to bring these passions together for agriculture and energy. And what I was able to do was to work, in my very first summer I was out in the field pulling up soybeans and pulling them uh, up the, the hydrogenases that were in their roots, trying to understand if there was an energy play here. Could we make our own energy from the hydrogenases that were in this soil? So that really started me down the road towards where uh, ultimately where I would end up in the research that I've been working on. And then of course from there I went to the big time, and uh, football big time, and I uh, went to the University of Georgia and uh, was able to be one of the first postdoctoral scientists in the Center for Metalloenzyme Studies, which today is one of the recognized uh, centers in the country for the study of proteins that have metals in them. And it was at this time that I really became interested in the enzyme nitrogenase and this whole problem of nitrogen. And so that, that then led me to the research problem, now part two of the talk, that I want to tell you about this issue of nitrogen and how it relates to energy. And so first of all, let's put nitrogen into context so everybody knows that nitrogen is an element, that element is essential for all of life, and this just shows you a protein and nucleic acid with sort of the classic coloring of the different elements. And what's important for our conversation is the nitrogen's in blue. And so it's very easy to see that nitrogen is an integral part of our proteins and of our DNA. And so we have to have nitrogen. And where do we get that nitrogen from? Well, for us, it comes from proteins, uh, proteins that we eat, it can come from, if it's a plant, it can come from urea or nitrate or ammonia, but we have to have that source of nitrogen. And it turns out it's the element that's most often limiting in the environment. Now we don't think about that as humans in the western part of the world because we have an abundance of protein in our diet, but it turns out most humans even have an, a deficiency of this nitrogen source protein in their diet. So it's actually a limiting element for humans as well. And as you can see here, the need in living organisms is a pretty substantial need compared to carbon. We're carbon-based life. So this is a very important need, is to have some form of nitrogen. And it turns out, this is a, a little bit ironic, is that nitrogen, we're swimming in nitrogen. As you probably know, 80% of the air you're breathing right now is into gas. And so you're swimming in nitrogen, but we have no way of getting our hands on it. It's an inert molecule. The N2 molecule has a triple bond, which is nearly impossible to break. You can put out fires with N2. I mean, it's so inert. And so nitrogen is part of what's called a global cycle. And nitrogen, N2, uh, you see it's part of a global cycle. It can be turned into ammonia. We'll come back to that. And that ammonia that's in the environment gets utilized by a whole suite of different organisms and gets oxidized to compounds like nitrite and nitrate. And then a whole different suite of organisms can take that nitrate, turn it into nitrite, and all the way back into N2. And so this is part of the cycle of, of nitrogen. And you can see then there's a little bit of a potential problem with this cycle in that it could potentially be unsustainable. Well, what I mean by that is if you start with ammonia, you see you can go around this way and then back around this way, and then you go to N2. And of course, the problem with N2 is then it leaves the environment, goes up into the air. And so this is actually the fate of most of the fertilizer that farmers put onto their field, is that these organisms are hard at work, actively in the soil, and they turn most of that fertilizer into N2 gas, and it just blows off. And so obviously for this cycle to be sustainable, there has to be a way to go from N2 back into ammonia. And that process we generally call nitrogen fixation. And I became very interested in this process when I was a postdoc for a couple of reasons. The agricultural connection is obvious, but also the energy connection. Turns out that this process is like the number two or three industrial process worldwide. And this process consumes somewhere on the order of two to three percent of our global energy. So this is a massive energy process of converting into, into ammonia. So let's talk a little bit about how this happens and what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do as our team. So it's, it's sort of fun to think about this a little bit about how uh, food production and world population have tracked each other over time. And so let's go back in time here. This is a graph, uh, 1900 going up until almost the present day. And this is the amount of harvested or uh, in world population. And what you can see is the world population was fairly stagnant, pretty slow growth up until about 1950. And one of the reasons for this slow growth was the lack of food. Right? So the world population was limited by the availability of food and protein in particular. 
So there wasn't enough protein to support uh, a growing population of humans. And this was uh, driven largely by old time agriculture, right? The only sources of nitrogen we had were natural nitrogen or we had the animal manures and things like that. And so the intensive agricultural model that we see today that allows population to grow didn't exist then. And part of the reason for that was the inavailability of nitrogen. So if we look over on this graph, this is again the same, roughly the same time frame, and you can see them looking at nitrogen. The production of nitrogen is essentially stagnant until about 1950. Well, two key discoveries had to happen to change all of this. The first one came by a German scientist back in about 1908 by the name of Fritz Haber. And Fritz Haber uh, discovered how to take into gas out of the air and turn it into ammonia. And so he won a Nobel Prize in 1918 for that discovery. And that happened in about, as I said, about 1908. But you see, that wasn't enough. There needed to be something else. And it turns out that something else was this process that he invented, uh, discovered, was extremely energy intensive. So we needed cheap and lots of energy. And that came in the form of the discovery of petroleum. And so you can see the discovery of petroleum, the utilization of petroleum starts right here about this time frame. This is CO2 production, and this is sulfur production, which tracks the utilization of coal and gas, etc. And so you can see the consequences of this is as we start to use petroleum, now suddenly nitrogen fixation by the Haber process just shoots up, and the, and the result of that is food production. There's a sharp increase in food production, and there's a sharp increase in, in human population. And so this is all intertwined, food and energy and nitrogen. And that's really what got my interest in this. Haber, let's take just a minute to talk about Fritz Haber. And so Fritz Haber was, a, as I said, a German scientist, won the Nobel Prize in 1918 for this discovery of taking a metal catalyst and converting into, with hydrogen, into ammonia. It's a very costly process. It requires very high temperatures. You can see 500 degrees C, 200 atmospheres, and it's very energy intensive with heat and pressure. Um, for, uh, Carl Bosch was a, a German engineer who came along shortly after and helped to scale up the process so that it could be done on an industrial scale. He won the Nobel Prize, as you can see, as well. So many people have argued that this discovery and this scale up was the most important technological invention of the last century because it could be argued that 40% of the Earth's population is alive today because of this reaction. 40% of the people in this room, you could say, are alive because of this reaction. Without that, the world population couldn't have grown. But then we still have this vexing problem of the enormous energy need for this. So the question that I had, and, and that we've been working on now for about 30 years, is what about the natural process for doing this? Can we learn something from that that we could then apply to help us understand how we could solve this nitrogen problem? And so this problem is um, one that nature solved, and. Uh, is one that we've been trying to understand. This is a picture of uh, my father-in-law's soybean field in northeast Iowa. It's a beautiful field. If you've never stood in the middle of a soybean field, you need to do it sometime. It's quiet, and you're just standing amongst all this food. It's absolutely amazing. And it's, what's sort of fun about it, too, is that nowadays, of course, you look, there's no, whoops, no weeds in here. Go back. There's no weeds in here. And of course, that's because these are all GMO soybeans, right? They all have Roundup Ready in them, and they don't have any weeds anymore, which is sort of fun. But what I've done many times in this particular soybean field, and, and I encourage you to do it if you ever get a chance, is you just go grab one of those soybean plants and pull it up and look at the roots. What you'll see is this. You'll see that the roots are full of these structures. They look like tumors that are on the roots of this soybean. They're called nodules. And inside those nodules are housed bacteria. And those bacteria are doing this fantastic reaction of turning into, into their own fertilizer. And they're doing it not at 500 degrees and all 200 atmospheres. They're doing it at room temperature, at regular atmospheres, etc. So there's some lessons to be learned here. And the bacteria that are doing this are called rhizobia. These are the very bacteria the D. Wynne Thorne worked on back in the 1930s. And so these bacteria are living inside these roots and they're turning into, into ammonia. They're making more than enough for themselves and also plenty for the plant. And so they provide extra nitrogen to the plant. The plant is providing photosynthate, which it's making in abundance to the bacteria. And that extra nitrogen is used to make protein. That's what we're after, of course, with soybeans is the protein that's in there. That protein can be either used to feed our animals that we then use as a source of protein, or we can use that protein directly as a source of energy and as a source of nitrogen. And so what we wanted to try to do when I started working on this problem was to try to understand not the bacteria, but actually the enzyme 
that can do this sort of miraculous reaction of taking into and turning it into ammonia. And so we started uh, many years ago now working on this enzyme. And I could give a, another 50-minute talk on this enzyme. Obviously, that's what I do uh, regularly, but I won't. I've limited myself to this one slide <laughs> and uh, disciplined myself to one slide. But what I will tell you is that we've been working on two different areas, and I think we've made some pretty major breakthroughs. And I see a lot of the guys from the lab sitting in the back up there, so they're, they can be quite proud of this. Uh, we've made some pretty big breakthroughs in two areas. One is that to get into reduction up here, we require electrons and we require ATP. Those are the two key things that we have. And what we've been trying to understand is where those electrons come from and how they get to N2. And we've been trying to understand what the role of ATP is in this. And I think we've come up with fairly recently, I think both of those teams of students have been made some really good progress on this. We've come up with some fairly uh, substantial models for how we think those electrons and ATP are coupled and how they get into this process. And also, we've made uh, some pretty significant progress in understanding how it is that N2 gets turned into ammonia, the intermediates that are involved and the, the steps that are involved. And I think these are really important breakthroughs and are starting to understand the fundamentals of this process. And I think that's what we're getting a lot of recognition for right now uh, is because we're making progress in these two different areas. So again, I, I wish I could tell you more, but I won't. I'll discipline myself and just let you know that those are the two things that we've been working on. Now, as I've been thinking about you know, what this has meant to me to work on this enzyme, I think obviously pushing the frontier, the unknown of this process that's so important to agriculture and has such a consequence on energy has been important. But probably even more important have been the people that I've had a chance to work with. And so this is a slide that shows some of the former postdocs and, and graduate students that I've had a chance and opportunity to work with over the years advancing this project. And some of these uh, folks uh, are now uh, teaching and scientists of their own. And so quite proud of the fact that, uh, for example, Bill Lanzalotta, uh, Scott remembers Bill, uh, was one of the first graduate students that I had. And Bill Lanzalotta is now almost a full professor at the University of Georgia in the biochemistry department. Uh, Brett Barney, fairly recent postdoc, just finished. He's now assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And we have uh, Pacific University, uh, Janine Chan is a faculty member there now, a full professor there. Matt Ryle is one of the leaders at IDEX Pharmaceuticals, a company that makes antifungal compounds. Uh, Robert Igarachi is at the University of Central Florida. Madeline Roche at uh, Cal State Fullerton. And, and uh, Brad Wallen now down in Salt Lake City working for one of the biggest cement companies in the world. So I've had a great opportunity to work with some really brilliant young scientists and to help them uh, move on in their careers. And there's many more that I don't list here. These are just the ones that uh, came to mind. And also in addition to training, we've had a little bit of fun. This is a picture, obviously very old. Uh, this was back before I was married, <laughs> yes. And uh, here, this is a picture of Bill Lancelotta, Janine Chan, and I at the Rodin Museum in Paris. If you've never been there, it's definitely worth your time. We were at a meeting, had an opportunity to go tour the Louvre at the Rodin Museum, et cetera. So we've had a lot of fun along the way. Uh, this is just one example of many. Now we move to the modern times. A lot of uh, great scientists are working with me right now. This is a picture of uh, just a, from a year ago or so of many of the, uh, the scientists that are in the group right now. Many of the undergraduates couldn't make it for the picture that day. I won't run through all of their names. Uh, they're all most in the back room here. Uh, some new additions, uh, Andrew and AJ are new additions to the lab. They weren't in that picture. And so working with these young scientists and having the opportunity uh, to help train them and also to work as a team to try to solve these problems is one of the most fulfilling and exciting parts of what I think I do in this job. But also part of this, I get an opportunity to work with some fantastic collaborators. And so I've worked with uh, people, some of the best scientists in the world uh, on this project. And this is a picture of two of them. This is uh, uh, Dennis Dean, who is one of the world leaders in microbiology at, the, at Virginia Tech University. And this is Brian Hoffman at Northwestern University, who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And we work close enough together that we Skype each other multiple times per day sometimes. And so this is an incredible opportunity to work with people like this. But again, we also makes a little fun with this. You probably noticed at the bottom here, this was at the King's Arms Pub, very good beer, in Oxford, England. We were there just a year ago. And so opportunity to work with uh, some of the best people in the world is one of the, the great uh, values of this job. And of course, publications. We've been uh, quite fortunate to have our work published in some of the best journals in the world. Now we're over 100 publications. We just had that celebration. But more importantly, over the weekend, I sat and thought about, well, 
the publications are nice, but what's the impact been on students and on postdocs? And so what I sat down was I counted how many student postdoc authorships that have been on all of these papers, and it's nearly 200. And so you think about the impact that has on young careers. This is the currency that we use in our business, our publications. I'm quite proud of the fact that there's been 200 student authorships on these publications over the, over the years. Funding, of course, we're quite thankful, as Jim has said in the introduction, uh, been funded by uh, best agencies out there. NIH, we're currently funded by them. We're currently funded by the National Science Foundation, currently funded by the Department of Energy, have in the past been funded by USGA, and, and again, uh, USTAR, an uh, important uh, contribution to our fuel uh, project, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. All right. So what I want to tell you about is just briefly about a new project that we've started about five or six years ago. I don't know if Bayard, yeah, Bayard came in. Bayard and I and Ron Sims sat in uh, some conference rooms about seven years ago, and we kept asking the question, uh, can we use microbes and sun uh, to take CO2 and turn it into fuels that we could use in the transportation sector. And so we started this project about seven years ago now, and uh, it's been a great project has been a lot of fun and the concept is a simple one to understand can we use microbes and we had worked with phototrophic microbes before this can we use these microalgae platforms and co2 and sunlight to make fuels and this is sounds quite simple but it turns out there's many difficult steps along the way here and we've been very successful at this we've had uh, Bruce Bugby uh, come in on the group in recent years and really added a lot to this and so we've made a lot of progress in this and the team that's we pulled together the current team as you can see, it includes Bayard Wood in mechanical engineering and Foster in biological engineering. Uh, Jason Quinn is a new addition. He's in mechanical and, of course, Bruce uh, in the crop sciences. And this project's been a lot of fun for the multidisciplinary aspect of it because we're sitting across the table from agriculture people and across the table from engineering people, and they're sitting across the table from chemists and biochemists, and the students are also doing the same. And this has had a, tr a tremendous impact on the students' training that they don't even know. And so they don't even know that they're starting to talk like engineers, right? The biochemists. And until recently, one of our first students on this project, uh, Brad Wallen, interviewed for a company uh, that's working in cement. It's the biggest cement company in the world down in Salt Lake City. And what they were looking for is they were looking for somebody that was both a microbiologist and could talk to engineers. Well, he was one of the first students on this project. For him, it was natural to do that. He had been on sites and done engineering projects. And so when they interviewed him, within minutes after he left, the phone rang and they said, is this guy for real? I mean, this guy seems like he's both an engineer and a biochemist at the same time. I said, yeah, this is who he is. They hired him instantly, right? And they offered him a big salary. And so this has been a lot of fun for the students. And they don't even realize, I think, the, the cross-disciplinary training that they're getting as part of this project. And just to give you an example of this, I say Mike came in someplace. Uh, this was uh, the project that we worked on last summer. The project was, the goal was to, we're making fuels. And we think the fuels are high quality. We're running them in engines. And we think they should be quite uh, usable. And so we said, well, if if we're right about this, let's put our money where our mouth is and let's go set a land speed record. And so, so Mike uh, Morgan and the team of engineers on really short notice put together this car. And we decided to go for a fairly uh, small engine. This is basically a lawnmower engine because the first time you make these fuels, it takes time, right? It's a lot of work. And so we wanted to start with a small amount of fuel. So we built this car ran our USU renewable biofuels in it, and Mike went out there and set the land speed record on September, you can see 10th, 2012, with our fuels. And so this was really a proud moment for the whole team because all the way from growing the algae and growing the yeast that we use for fuels, all the way to how do we turn them into fuels that have high quality, to actually delivering on that at the end. And so it's really a, a, a great example of a, a true cross-disciplinary project, which is we're really excited about going forward. We're going to go a lot faster this year, right, Mike? Uh, Mike's the driver there. He's an undergraduate student in biochemistry. And so he's been involved in building the car and also in uh, turning the fuels into, turning the compounds into the fuels that we run in this car. And so it's, again, another example of the cross-disciplinary nature of, of uh, what you can do. So this is a great project. We're having a lot of fun with it. Now, the last thing I want to tell you, I think I'm pretty close to being on time, is I want to tell you how to avoid work. And so I ran into this little book. It's a very small book, just uh, about a year ago. And this book was published in the 1950s by William Riley. And the title of the book is How to Avoid Work. If you haven't read it, it's worth reading. Because what it tells you is, basically, you need to chase something you're really interested in. Don't 
worry about the day-to-day, -day, you know, how am I going to make a living at this? And what I realized is that I had the opportunity, starting way back when, to chase what I really loved and what I was interested in and not have to worry about work. And so this was really, a, it's an insightful little book. If you haven't had a chance to, to read it, I would encourage you to read it. And a couple of quotes out of there that I think are worth thinking about that caught my attention. One is that this quote that says, the greatest satisfaction you can obtain from life is your pleasure in producing in your own individual way something of value to your fellow man. That is creative living. And so as I think about it, uh, I think that's, I guess that's what I've been doing, right? I've been, in my own way, making a contribution. And each of us can do that, right, in our own way. And that's really avoiding work. You're really trying to do what, chasing your passion, what you're really excited about and what you like doing. And then one other quote from there that, I, it, that sort of stuck with me as I read this was this last one. Uh, for you, life can be a succession of glorious adventures or it can be a monotonous bore. Take your choice. <laughs> and I, th I think I've chosen the one of adventures. I wouldn't say they are all glorious, <laughs> but they've certainly been adventures. I don't think it's ever been a bore. So I think I've made my choice on this path, and I encourage you to think about that as well. And finally, let me just say a few thank yous. First, a thank you to my wife, Kim. I didn't realize Scott was going to betray me with all those personal <laughs> facts, but those are <laughs> mostly true, almost, al almost always true. And let me just uh, thank uh, uh, my family, uh, my two boys, and my wife, Kim, for uh, allowing me to do all this and also for tolerating my passion for hiking. And so many of you probably know I love to hike. This is us in, in southern Utah uh, about a month ago, and we really like that. And they, my kids always say, do we have to do another hike, Dad? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and so I appreciate them tolerating me for that and also helping me to be able to do in this job. And lastly, let me thank uh, USU, uh, all my colleagues, and obviously the, the environment here, the support from the administration for making uh, this kind of uh, research that we do possible and for allowing me to pursue my passion and to avoid work. <laughs> thank you. Questions? I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes. Any questions? Chris. Chris. So there's a lot of folks in the biotech field that are interested in genetically engineering nitrogen fixation for plants other than legumes. Do you have yes. a sense of where that is? Do you mm -hmm. see promise in that area? I do. Matter of fact, I just came back from uh, NSF is starting a new program called Ideas Labs. I don't know if you've heard about these. Where basically they bring some of the best people in the field together in a uh, sequestered location, and then they just have this think tank. You just think outside the box, and what can you come up with? And I had the great privilege of being part of one of those recently in England. And I can tell you that there's some really exciting stuff that's going on in that front, uh, where we're starting to figure out. It's a complex process, as you know. Starting to figure out how to mobilize the, all that suite of genes and move them into plants, and so. There are some uh, really good prospects of nitrogen fixing rice coming down the road. And so I think within our lifetimes, we will see that happen. Yeah. Ed. Lance, you didn't mention anything about your um, discovery of converting the nitrogenase enzyme into something that can reduce CO2, which I think could be an absolutely incredible invention. Is an incredible invention. Yes. It could have great industrial importance for you. Say anything about where that's going? You bet. Happy to. <laughs> yes, I'll repeat the question as well. So the question that Ned was asking, Ned knows because we've sat and chatted quite a lot about this, is uh, we discovered recently that there's a way to take nitrogenase, which normally is reducing N2 into ammonia, and to modify it just a little bit so that it would take CO2 and do something with it. And that, of course, is one of the holy grails in science today, is to take this abundant gas that we have, carbon dioxide, and turn it into something. And what we discovered, Zhang Yang, someplace in here, I saw him, there he is, he, he made this discovery that with this modified nitrogenase, he could actually take CO2 and not just do something with it, but he could actually turn it into methane, into a fuel. And then if he coupled it with acetylene, he could actually turn it into propylene. And those of you that aren't in the know, propylene is one of the two key compounds that are used in the synthesis of polyesters and things like that. It's dominated by uh, being made from petroleum. And so we've discovered uh, in a really remarkable reaction that, that Ned's aware of, that we can take CO2 and turn it into methane and into propylene and all kinds of different things. And we were fortunate enough to have that work published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just about a year ago. And so that's a very exciting area, yes, that we're looking forward to going forward. We put a proposal into DOE to see if they're in as interested as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Lance, what, one of your, sure. a lot of your conversation about the training of 
the next generation of students. Oh, oh, and yeah. they, obviously you're very passionate about it. You know, we live inside the academy with a fairly traditional approach. Um, right. Are there things you would do to sort of break the mold, change things? Um, you know, have you discovered in, in your work with students uh, a different way that we might think about the training mm. of our students? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the project we're working on with the car really shows the seeds of what I think is a really powerful tool there. And that is that you throw onto the table in front of a team of people, this is the grand challenge. This is what we want to do. And you have to, you're going to have to talk to the engineers. You're going to have to talk to the chemists. You're going to have to work with the agriculture people. How are you going to make this happen? And it's too big for one person to do. And the students rise to the occasion. They talk across the tables. And in the process, they don't even know it, but they're learning. And they're really you know, starting to sharpen their skills in ways that are really incredible. So I think that's a powerful learning tool. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2012 D. Wynn Thorne. Thank you.